Hi there, you're listening to the Guitar Speak podcast, produced in Sydney, Australia, and Zoomed all around the world through iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thanks for joining me. My name is Matt Wakely. Now today, we speak to an amazing young guitar player, Rupam Garg from Boston in the United States, uh, part of an incredible band called The Surrealist. Now these guys are very much on the front edge of a really great uh, fresh wave of new progressive music, really drawing on influences like progressive rock, um, metal, eastern influences, minimalist kind of things. So uh, these guys, they're probably on from the same planet as uh, perhaps bands like Animals, as Leaders, or the, uh, the Sydney artist Pliny, but very much carving out their own sound. So it was awesome to talk to Rapalm, just an incredible guitar player. Um, we'll get to that very, very soon. First, we've got a little bit of news from us here at the Guitar Speak podcast. Now, for April, we're, uh, we've got a special segment called Ask Peter Northcote. Now, Peter, as you might know, was um, our guest in Episode 7. He's probably one of the most recorded guitar players in Australia, playing on countless sessions and, and gigs. So Peter has a wealth of knowledge and uh, lots of good stories too. So uh, if you've got a question for him, it could be just about guitar playing, it could be about something specific about Peter's career. Either way, that's fine. Email it to us at guitarspeakpodcast at gmail.com. And during April, Peter will answer those questions. Now that's in addition to our regular weekly interviews. We've got some amazing guests coming up. All right, our other piece of news is that we have launched a Patreon page. Now what that means is that you can financially support the podcast if you would like to. Now I need to stress this podcast is free and it always will be. You do not have to pay to subscribe to us in any shape or form. But if you would like to support us financially, that's great. That helps us cover our running costs and move ahead. So if you go to patreon.com forward slash guitar speak podcast, there's a bunch of options there where you can support us for $1 a month. Uh, or some other areas. Now, there are some rewards for different areas of support, things like bonus monthly content, uh, our newsletter, which will uh, give advance notice of who we have booked for interviews. So you might want to get in touch with us with a question or something that we'd, we'd consider before a certain interview, things like that. There's a producer level where we will read your name at the end of the show and name you as uh, one of the co-producers of the program. So a few, a few different options. All right, so that's the idea with Patreon. Okay, now on to our interview with Rapoom Garg. Now, before we speak to him, I want you to hear a bit of his incredible guitar playing with the band The Surrealist. This is part of a track called Naked Awareness from the EP of the same name. Rupam Garg, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. Great. Great to have you. Now, you're up in Boston at the Berkeley uh, College of Music. How long have you been studying at Berkeley? So, I've been here for two years or so. Uh-huh. And, uh, and uh, it's been absolutely great, you know, just like coming here and like meeting like, like my musicians who are incredibly inspiring and uh, it's been great here so far. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um we should go back a little a little further. Well, I'd, I'd love to talk more about Berkeley as well, but um, what got you started sure. playing guitar in the first place? And when did that, that all happen for you? 
Yeah, sure. So this happened, hmm, I would say, in my middle school years. Uh, it's actually a really funny story. Uh, I had a crush, actually, back in middle school who was playing guitar, and uh, um, and she was really good. And, uh, and to impress her, I obviously picked up the guitar, and uh, <laughs> I unsuccessfully uh, tried to woo her over. Um, uh, and she moved actually. So, but then uh, I just ended up just uh, like still playing the guitar and stuff. So that's actually how it started. <laughs> so it's, it's a girl. That's a classic yeah. guitar story. That's that's yeah, great. Uh, I guess it's like a true love story. <laughs> <laughs> hey, middle school. I'm I'm just trying to get the age. So is that around thirteen, fourteen years old? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I'd say it's like twelve. I would say. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cool. And what kind of stuff were you playing? What were you trying to impress this young lady with? So when I first started out, I would say I would listen to a lot of Lincoln Park and uh, 30 Seconds to Mars, My Chemical Romance. And actually, these are bands that I still listen to today mm -hmm. because there's a lot of merit in the musicality and the musicianship that is sort of more like subtle, but it's still there. And yeah. they're actually like, I mean, and they're actually geniuses. So... Uh, they're bands that I grew up with and they're bands that I still listen to today. Okay. And what were the... Do you remember the first songs you you tried to play? Were you like learning songs or did you go through lessons and you did Mary Had a Little Lamb or what was your what was your <laughs> formal training? Uh, I love that song, Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> um, so, uh, it, so initially I was self-taught. Um, I did have a teacher back in school, but I never took that too seriously. And instead, I would just go on YouTube or like online and just learn myself. And in terms of the first song, I wouldn't say I knew exactly what I would play. I do know that uh, I would actually listen to like a lot of Green Day as well, and I would try to learn their songs. Okay, yeah. uh, they were mostly, uh, I mean, like really heavy, like power chordal songs and. Yep. Uh, it's, it's like same with bands like Linkin Park, uh, like very like a simplistic drop tuned uh, chords that I would just try and like pick up on. Okay, great. And um, do you remember your first guitar? Yeah, it was a a Stratocaster knockoff, I would say. Okay. <laughs> it, yep. uh, it, yeah, like it was an unbranded electric guitar uh, that was red that was was actually pretty good back uh, like like back in the day but uh but yeah so that was my first guitar okay cool and um there was there a point where you remember getting into more progressive kind of influences i guess the lincoln park that for me that explains a bit of the extended range interest that you would have um in terms yeah. of tunings uh, and things but when when did you start listening to perhaps some more progressive music it's a good question. I would say my music tastes, they jump quite a bit. So uh, I would say that the, uh, my progressive tastes actually originated from bands like Meshuga and like just really heavy bands like yeah, that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So so I'm a jump from Linkin Park to Meshuga and then, and then I slowly evolved into the progressive scene. Sure, yeah. So um, were you playing in bands around this time? I guess I'm thinking you're... A moving into your teenage years a bit more now yeah yeah we doing bands? i've only ever been I've, I've i've only ever been in one band in my life which is the surrealist okay. and actually interestingly enough so back in high school uh with uh, this band uh, the surrealist it wasn't the same band as it was now so there were different members and it wasn't even me who like started the band but the thing is that that band broke up but I decided to steal the name of that. That's a cool band. name. And I just, yes. Yeah, because like it's a great name for what we're trying to do. So uh, yeah, so like I just ended up stealing it. But uh, but I was also in my high school jazz band, if that counts. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but like apart from that, I was never into like being in many groups at the same time. It's okay. always been like one focus. Yeah. So what was that first iteration of the Surrealist like? What kind of music were you guys playing? So back in high school, it was um, music based off of like very straightforward, like so like it was based off like Lincoln Park, like Green Day, etc. And sure. we would play a lot of cover songs. Yeah. Um, but but uh, like I said, uh, that band has sort of died off, and then like uh, this band, like, like right now uh, with the Surrealists, it's like a completely different band. Yeah, it's not sure. even the same. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Sure. And um, were you writing? Did you start writing from the, the get-go? 
Yeah, uh, I've always been a writer, actually. I've never really been interested in like learning other people's songs at all. Uh, so like, I would pick up a few pieces here and there, but I've always been a writer. And like to me, like writing music is like the highest like form of like creation, I would say. So that's something I've um, been really into. Awesome. awesome. So um, when did you find yourself um, thinking seriously about studying further? And obviously you're, you're at Berkeley now, which, uh, which we mentioned. Right. It's, that's a good question. Um, uh, I guess I could answer this in like the extreme opposite form, which is that I don't see myself doing anything else. Uh-huh. Yeah. So... Uh, so I guess music has always been like the, pre- uh, the predominant like element in my life, and I just don't see myself like doing anything else. But that's not to say that I don't do anything else, which kind of pertains to the band. I've been uh, doing the graphic design for the band. I've been exploring uh, the marketing side and the business side of the band as well. But I've never seen myself doing anything else as uh, my, uh, like as my main source of like. Um, like of activity, I would yeah. say. Okay, awesome. The the graphic work is fantastic, Rapalm. I'm loving that stuff. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, did you do the videos as well? So uh, the video that we uh, released with Origami, so that was yeah. not done by me. So that was outsourced by somebody else. But that video itself was an inspiration for me to pick up uh, like on the graphic design. So okay. okay, I've actually been studying graphic design for like many many months now, and it's it's like its own world. It's like the visual medium of music and it's incredible. So, uh, so going forward, uh, we will be doing all the graphic design ourselves in house. Awesome. It's great. Yeah. It's very cool that the, uh, the album covers and things look, look great. And, um, so, so what's Berkeley life like? I mean, Berkeley's got such a rich heritage of, of amazing guitar players and, and bands for that matter coming out of Berkeley, like Dream Theater, um, Mike Stern, um, there's a yeah. huge list. I won't go through all of it, but tell me about um, being at Berkeley. So being at Berkeley is great. It's definitely been a life changer, actually. Uh, just being immersed in an environment filled with you know, with like such talented musicians, such you know, such like a diverse group of people that it, it like it changes you both from a musical level and also from a personal level as well. You just become a, like a lot more aware of uh, different people's uh, perspectives on like life and like it it inspires you in, in more than one ways and and just being at berkeley has has really shaped uh my vision and and also uh, for the vision of the band as well so it's been great yeah cool very good do you have a um a major area of study yeah, so currently I'm doing a guitar performance and music business as well as okay. a dual major. Right. Uh, so like a Berkeley has uh, different majors that they offer. So this is mine. Excellent. So the Surrealist, so the band as we know it now, um, so you're saying that band formed at Berkeley. So who else is in, yes. in the band? So uh, all of us are Berkeley musicians. It's a trio setting. So there's me, and then there's John Mark Degard, who's our drummer, yep. and then Bowman Edwards, the bass player. Cool. Nice. Now you guys released your um, debut EP, Naked Awareness, in September yeah. last year. Great stuff, man. I loved it. Is there? Um, can you talk me through the Thank process so of writing and, and putting that together? Sure. So. The collection of songs that are found on Naked Awareness are actually pretty old. They actually date back to 2012, but okay. they've never been formally released before. And and I perceive that record as more of a record to let go of um, of our previous inspirations, of our previous tastes. And so, in terms of our writing process, we uh, so most of the songs were written by me and. And the way it was done was I would simply sit and write and then record at the same time, which means like I would literally just like do it all at once. And then what would happen was I would get um, some input from John Mark or from Bowman. And then and then the entire process of like songwriting and composition would just be done um, in like a few weeks or so. And then we would get it mixed and mastered, obviously. Uh, and so that process took about, uh, I'd say like a two or three months, but the actual songs themselves, they lasted for like two or three years. Okay. Okay. Wow. 
So when you say you're you're writing and recording at once, are you like are you putting ideas together to edit or to arrange later, or are you how, how's that work out? Right. So we never have like any demo songs uh, at all because we feel that uh, the final like sonic result is incredibly vital to the end product of the song. So uh, say like if you record a demo, it's not the final product, but yeah, sure. to us that like so like that to us it doesn't really make sense from uh, the way we like make music, which is like we literally want to have the sounds like the, the final sounds like like with us as we write music because mm-hmm. we feel that that facilitates uh, our inspiration and our songwriting because so for example with the guitar it's such a versatile instrument right that that like you can achieve um, a plethora of like incredible sounds but but it's like to us it's really useful to have the final sounds as we write because then we get a better idea of what the final product will look like so you're not one for recording parts and then trying to shape the sounds later. You're really just trying to capture uh, what you're doing at the time. Yes, exactly. That's awesome. That seems like a very in the moment, real kind of way to to get it happening. The um, yeah, I, I love your playing. There's some um, really interesting things going on that I listened first, and then I started digging through some videos just to see how you're creating some of these sounds, um, which was fun because when I'd hear the textures and then. I was trying to guess how's he creating these sounds, and then I see you playing. So you seem um, you've developed some really interesting techniques. Like um, you seem to use a lot of sweep picking, but not not in the sweep arpeggio kind of conventional way that we would know through shredding. Um, uh, Can you explain what you're doing there? Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess what you're referring to is it's kind of like harp picking, where I would pick the highest note of the string group with my middle finger, yeah. which kind of achieves a circular harp uh, sort of effect, which which is really a, like which is really great for creating these really like interesting and unique uh, like shapes uh, on on the instrument. So uh, and the way that was developed was basically you just practice sweep picking and then you practice your hybrid picking and then you combine the two which achieves a really interesting on guitar like sound which is something that I'm really into flavor of, of those ideas that's that's really cool how'd you end up with that stuff is that just wood shedding or did you see or hear some something that inspired that approach yeah so i believe that the guthrie govin and the toast nabasi of animals and leaders they have been exploring the technique uh, although maybe not to a great degree but uh, i guess they founded this technique uh, which is amazing and it just like it just served as a source of inspiration to just really go deep and see uh like uh, how like how complex this technique can become and uh, uh and like how much you can achieve with it mm-hmm. so that's definitely something that i've been interested in for like the past many years or so yeah cool it looks like a lot of your a lot of your technique um is very reliant on the right hand in terms of muting and these little sweep ideas and the harmonics and and all that kind of approach yeah that's definitely true uh we like as a uh, I'd say, like, as a guitar player, I definitely, like, am more interested in the textual possibilities of the guitar uh, as opposed to the melodic or the chordal uh, aspects of it. Because, like, there are an infinite possibilities with what you can do with the guitar. Like, uh, there are no two notes that sound alike. And especially with the right hand, you can achieve a lot of these really cool, deep, and lush textures uh, that go really well uh, with the kind of music we're writing. Yeah, awesome. Hey, that's really interesting what you say about texture over um, melodic or harmonic 
content because that was totally one of my one of my notes um i mean that's the yeah. immediate thing which i love i found it so refreshing that um right. text just seems very much the priority of the surrealist over over melodic ideas and um oh definitely and that's and that's a uh, so like I'd say that that's a taste that I've kind of picked up on from like soundtracks or like I don't know like so like if you listen to a movie or if you like watch like you know like a game or anything like yeah. uh, I'd say that the film soundtracks they they have a lot of textural sort of soundscapes that I've really been into the past few years or so. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I was, I was hearing also American sort of minimalism kind of ideas, if not if in direct inspiration, definitely in the aesthetic, something like Steve Reich, Terry Riley kind of stuff. Oh, yes, yes, 100%. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of those um, guys and they're absolutely beautiful uh, creators. So you have just released um, a new single, Origami, which um, I think Guitar World picked it up and a bunch of people are, are spreading the love of that, that song around, that's, yeah. that must be pretty cool. Oh yeah, so, so like we're super happy that we got that feature and uh, it's been an absolutely great release and, and, and like we're super overwhelmed with uh, like uh, with the feedback and the response that we've gotten. So, so we couldn't be happier with how things have turned out. That's great. Are you guys planning on, um, will there be a new release? Will Origami be off an upcoming release or um, how's that working? So, uh, I guess part of our content strategy is that we want to release a song every two and a half months or so. So, okay. um, yeah. I think with Origami, we, we released it like a month ago, and we want to release our next single that we're almost done, uh, perhaps like in a month. And so, uh, the, the, so uh, the plan for 2017 is to release one single every few months or so. Okay. That way... Yeah. Um, it just allows us to really focus on each individual song and to get it like just as good as we can get it to be. And then uh, we're going to keep focusing on the next song and so on and so forth. Okay, cool. Sounds like a good plan. Sounds like a very good plan. Um, yeah. Let's talk guitars. What what are you using there? I've seen some pictures of some... I think you're playing an 8-string by the looks of things? No, it's actually a 7-string piezo. Uh, um, it's an AM7. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, fan uh, uh, instrument which to me is like the most beautiful piece of creation I've seen in a long time um, yeah so it's a seven string uh, it's a bolt on neck it has a burled maple top uh, it's a swamp ash body has the keys pickups inside and it's just an all around like fantastic guitar wow that's cool I obviously wasn't paying that much attention if I thought it was an eight <laughs> but um okay so you're seven and you went standard tuning for that so a low b or are you doing something different uh so for a few of our tracks we're exploring with alternate with, uh, with like different tunings and we're going to be looking at some different tunings mm -hmm. uh, for a few new tracks that we're going to be releasing this year but uh, for the most part yeah it's in standard tuning okay yep cool and what's what's your recording process for the guitar for example like the clean tones which are a really big big deal in your in your um in your sound are um they're beautiful they sound to me quite direct in some ways what are you using so we're um using the axe x2 xl which is a beautiful piece of machine mm -hmm. and that's where we get all of our guitar sounds and okay. in fact i think all of the bass sounds will be coming through this uh, through, through the axe as well okay yep with your clean tone it, it sounds more full yeah. range than um, than a guitar amp, but is, is there any particular models that you're using on the XFX to get that sound? Um, that's an interesting point. Um, I would say that, so uh, I guess like part of our sound actually also comes from uh, the software that we use on the computer uh, with uh, all of our plugins uh, and the XFX as well, which maybe achieves that more full range sound, especially with the EQ that we have on. Okay. But yeah. there's no specific amp that I guess I could give you that would achieve that because yeah, it's sure. all done through like a complex routing in our uh, like software systems okay sure very cool very cool yeah it's great it's a great sound are you using um sounds like you're using pitch shifting and, and harmonizing a bit as well is that true 
uh, no, we've never actually choose any pitch shifter at all. Uh, really? Perhaps wow. what, like a patch, what, uh, like what we have been doing is we actually have like, uh, like a different, like, uh, like perhaps like a different take that's like layered on a okay. previous take yep. that, yeah, that might achieve that sound. Yeah, cool. And you are you are totally mixing lots of harmonics in with, with fretted notes, you know, traditionally fretted notes. So there's lots of octave sort of information going on as well. Right. Yeah. So what about non-guitar inspirations? Are there any, is there anything informing the way you play? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, so I've listened to a lot of like movie soundtracks. Yeah, uh, sure. I've, I've, so I've recently listened to the Ex Machina soundtrack, by, um, which is like an incredible like ambient, like sonic soundscape uh, soundtrack, which is just amazing. And, and I've just been listening to that nonstop for the past month or so. <laughs> awesome. And, uh, absolutely. Um, I listen to like the Dark Knight soundtrack, uh, and like just a lot of these like really like ambient great like projects that just like dwell in like different like like timbres than what you like you usually get with the guitar, and like which has truly shaped the way I craft my sound. recording process how are you how are you doing that are you working as a band in, in a room or are you putting down guitars and then adding drums or vice versa what's what's the idea there so we're all a multi-instrumentalist actually so we all write drum parts we all write guitar parts and bass parts and what we okay. do wow. is we would actually like write um, uh, and record each parts like okay so what we do is i would send a part to say like a drum after guard and he sent parts to me, and what we do is we just basically like mash up parts together and then see what works, and that's the way we songwrite. It's not a case where we like are in a room and then we jam together. It's like yeah, yeah. we smiles and then we just see what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Which actually some really interesting parts because uh, what sometimes our drummer would do is he would take some pre-existing parts and then he would like spice them around and like you mix them up which would create some really like interesting riffs that could not have been like achieved with just the guitar alone wow that's cool and then you've got to work out how to play them sometime yeah yeah <laughs> which is the most challenging part that's great that's such a 21st century way to uh to approach it yeah. i love that yeah yeah for sure it's like it's like definitely a lot more collaborative and it's um, a lot more efficient and you get some really interesting ideas by doing it this way um so you're talking about releasing singles throughout the year are there any plans to do live gigs yeah uh we're currently focused on composition but we'll definitely be gigging and be playing live hopefully by the start of 2018 okay if not yep. by 2017 okay cool. uh we yeah uh, we just feel like for now it's just better for uh, the band to just uh, keep writing and to just uh, keep on creating like uh, new and interesting sounds um and then, then soon we'll hit the road sure sounds good and how much um how much study have you got left at berkeley so i've been two years so i would say two more years or okay. one and a half years yeah 
Yep, so that's probably a pretty intense period of time you've got ahead of you anyway. Yeah. Nice. Well, if you can keep both things going, that's that's excellent. And um, yeah, look, definitely look forward to hearing more material from The Surrealist. What's the best way for people to keep up to date with what you guys are up to? So you can visit us on our website, which is thesurrealist.org. You can also find us on Facebook, um, on Instagram, and that's probably the best way to keep up with uh, what's going on. Well, cool. It seems like a very patient approach from you guys. You've got like a long-term plan. You're not just trying to blast out a record and then get out and do some gigs. You're actually seeming to be taking your time and wanting to get it exactly oh, yeah. as you want it. So that's very cool. Yeah, that's definitely true. And like, uh, and we feel like uh, with this approach, it's a lot, like it's a lot better to build a relationship with an audience because say if you have a full album with like 12 songs or so, it seems like it's too much content to just drop on one day versus yeah. if you have one song that you repeat over a few months, it's just uh, like uh, with that, you know, uh, we stay present and we like work hard, you know, with the next record, etc. Yeah, cool. We go on. It's great, great. Well, Rapalm, thank you so much for your time today. Really great to meet you. And um, yeah, like I said, we'll be following uh, The Surrealist with great interest. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Matt, for having me on the podcast. All right, there you go, Rupam Garg from The Surrealist. What a fantastic guitar player. It's a really great, a really great band and um, very articulate young man. I, I think uh, we'll hear a lot more from that band in the future. Props to Guitar World. Thanks for sharing their new track, Origami. That's how I discovered The Surrealist. And, you know, we get so much stuff in our news feeds, in our social media places, but, um, man, when you discover some genuinely exciting and refreshing new music Um, that's really really cool so thumbs up guitar world all right now if you want to check out any more of our guitar speak podcast interviews you totally can we're all over itunes and stitcher you can also find us on instagram and facebook and we're on twitter Okay, so a couple of things. Remember, get your questions in for Peter Northcote. He's got a couple already that he is working on, so that should be really cool. Also, please consider our Patreon page, uh, patreon.com forward slash guitar speak podcast, where you can support the show there as well, and that is greatly appreciated. All right, then. Thank you for joining me. My name's Matt Wakeling, and you've been listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. Until next time. Bye now.